Hey folks, been invited by the Virginia Beach Bee Club to speak on the honeybee biology. Basic honeybee biology, the colony, and getting started. It's a bug. One of the first things we have to come into concept with is that this is a wild bug. It's not a pet. It's not something that you can tell it what to do and it's going to do it. As a beekeeper, you're essentially helping them do what they already know how to do. I always tell folks, if you get in a, in a rush and you want to go outside and work with your bees, don't do that. Just go ahead and do what you got to do. And come back later on and then uh, work with them when you got plenty of time. Your bees will... Uh, are already set up to go ahead and do what they need to do. They're going to build comb. They're going to raise young. They're going to uh, make honey. They're going to bring in nectar, pollen, water, and uh, plant residents into that hive. And uh, what you're doing as a beekeeper is making it as easy as possible for them to be successful. So just remember, starting off, it's a bug. It's kingdom animalia, phylum erythropoda. Class, Insecta, Order, Hymenoptera, Family, Apidae, Genus, Apis, where we get into the bees right here, Species, Apis mellifera. It's the Western honeybee, also known as the European honeybee, not the U.S. bee. I know this is a joke, but there is no such thing as the United States honeybee. All of our honeybees came from over in Europe. They do have... Uh, wild bees in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, but we do not have any naturalized bees here in America. All of them that we have have been brought over from overseas. European honeybee. It's the most common of the 7 to 12 species of honeybee worldwide. I say 7 to 12 because it's gone up from 7 because of buckfast and all these other uh, bees that have been uh, uh, genetically worked out, not worked out. All these other bees that have been <clears throat> bred for certain specifics, whether it's uh, longevity, whether it's honey making, whether it's less swarming, or even uh, taking care of each other where they have less mites and pest problems. The western honeybee can be found on every continent except Antarctica. Humans are responsible for its considerable additional range. Introducing European subspecies into North America around the early 1600s. They're also in South America, Australia, New Zealand, and East Asia. The honeybee anatomy, you've got the head, thorax, which supports the wings and the legs, and the abdomen, three sections of the insect. On the head, you've got the compound eyes. You've got the ocelli. You've got the antenna. The jaw, upper lip, lower lip, tuber proboscis, the tongue which proceeds out of the tuber proboscis. You got the foreleg, middle leg, and hind leg. Forewing and hind wing. Yes, they do have two sets of wings, the fore wings and the hind wings. There's four total on a on a bee. The spiracles, these little dots that you see on the side of the abdomen is where the bee breathes through. It's one reason as a beekeeper, you want to be very aware of what is being sprayed around your bees, even if it's a herbicide and not an insecticide. Many herbicides start in crystal form and are, met, are mixed with water. If they are sprayed on flowers that your bees are going to and they dry up on the bee, many times when they crystallize, it will suffocate the bee. So in my case, when I have a farmer spraying his crops, I have it worked out to where he'll contact me whether he's spraying insecticide or herbicide so I can go ahead and lock my bees up the night before and wait until in the morning after he sprays, wait another hour and then release my bees so he won't be harmed by either herbicide or insecticide. And the sting, and of course this is the one that everybody's concerned about when it comes to uh, dealing with bees, whether you're a beekeeper or a person that lives next to bees, because this is what everybody thinks about or freaks out about. Of course, this cartoon is not even uh, correct in the fact that they've got the sting on the face like a mosquito instead of on the abdomen like a bee does. But even when they draw them out of anatomically correct, 
it still gets way out of there. Like all honeybees, the western honeybee is eurosocial. Eurosocial. In animal species, especially in insects, showing advanced level of social organization in which a single female produces the offspring and non-reproductive individuals cooperate in caring for the young, creating colonies with a single fertile female or queen. There's your queen right there in the middle. This one was marked for 2015 with the blue mark on a thorax. Many normally non-reproductive females or workers and a small proportion of fertile males or drones. And there's your drone right there. They're normally about 30% larger than the rest of the bees. Individual colonies can house tens of thousands of bees. This is what a typical frame of bees will look like. When you shake those bees off of that frame, this is what the frame should look like. This is your typical brood frame. Looks like a sunrise with the brood there. Above the brood is the pollen. And around the corners up there are the honey stores. All of that is there to feed their young. Colony activities are organized by complex communication between individuals. What you're seeing here is a activity called festooning. It's where the bees hang on to each other like the old game barrel of monkeys. And in doing so, they're using their own bodies as a plumb bob so that as they draw their comb out, it is 100% is level. To the gravity of the earth. Communication through pheromones will also take place in your bees. Your queen is constantly putting out pheromones to let the other bees know that she's healthy, that she's hungry, that she's full, that she's doing well, that she's not doing well. They can keep up with all of this just through the pheromones that she's putting out. Another communication that's done in your beehive is a thing called a waggle dance. This is done by your forager workers. They'll go out and find food and by using their ocelli, the three eyes that are on the very top of their head, not the compound eyes, they know where the sun's at, even when it's cloudy outside. They can still see where the sun's at. So all bees' direction is according to where the sun is. When they go inside the hive, the sun would be straight up. And so if you look at this diagram, say there's a uh, food source, and it's 15 degrees distant, 15 degrees angle from the angle of the sun. They will do that dance in that direction, 15 degrees, and the length of time that they spend on that dance during that straight line before they turn right and turn left will be the actual timing for the distance from the hive to that food source. Unlike most other bee species, honeybees have perennial colonies which persist year after year. They're not like wasps and hornets or bumblebees where the hive dies out and the queen burrows into the ground or someplace where she can survive the frost and it comes back out and starts a new hive. If the rest of the hive dies, the female dies. She has to be fed by workers her entire life, a diet of royal jelly. In this picture here, you're seeing a FLIR, F-L-I-R, that's an acronym standing for forward-looking infrared. That bright spot on that box is where the cluster of bees are inside of that box on a night when it's about four degrees outside. As a beekeeper, you never want to open up the box on cold nights like that. But that forward-looking infrared helps you to keep up with where your bees are at and how they're going to do over the winter. Colony life cycle. This is what that cluster of bees would look like outside of the box. Now, this is not a swarm. This is an actual colony of bees around comb that they have uh, put on a branch. Now, in a more temperate climate, they may, uh, they may survive the year. Uh, in, in other parts of the world. Here in America, this wouldn't this, this hive wouldn't make it through the wintertime. So finding this and getting these installed inside of a beehive is an actual rescue. Because of their high degree of social and because of their high degree of sociality and permanence, honeybee colonies can be considered superorganisms, meaning the reproduction of the colony rather than individual bees is the biologically significant unit. Honeybee colonies reproduce through a process called swarming. Scientifically, that term is fissioning. The swarming takes place. The bees just leave the hive. The reigning queen at the time 
goes up into the air and one third cut. The laying queen of the hive and two thirds to three quarters of the hive swarm with her. This number has been proven by Dr. Seeley and Dr. Rangel in a test that they did on seeing how much of the hive actually leaves. It's the reason why beekeepers need to really stay on top of their hives to make sure they don't swarm. If they swarm, you're not just losing a few bees or a quarter of your bees or even half of your bees. You're literally losing two thirds to three quarters of your bees. So if they swarm, you're not going to get much honey out of that hive that, uh, that particular season. In our climate, honeybees swarm in the spring and early summer when there's an abundance of blooming flowers from which they can collect nectar and pollen. In response to these favorable conditions, the hive creates one to two dozen new queens. Each one of these little peanuts coming off the bottom of this comb is a potential queen. These are queen cells. Just as the pupil stages of the daughter queens are nearly complete, the old queen and approximately two thirds to three quarters of the adult workers leave the colony in a swarm traveling some distance to find a new location suitable for building a hive. When they do that, the air is filled. Wherever the queen lands, the rest of the swarm will land with her and bivouac there until the foragers come back or scouts to let them know that they found a place for them to hive up. These are times when we do swarm rescues because many of these swarms do not make it through the following year. These are all different ways that they will swarm up and cluster up while they're waiting for the scouts to let them know they have a place to hive up. Sometimes the scout bees will lead the swarm to a hollow tree. And other times, if you're a good beekeeper, you'll have some swarm traps set out. This is a swarm at B&G's aviary. If you look over there to the left, Inside that circle, that's a marked queen. We didn't stay up with them good enough and they swarmed. But since we had a swarm trap up there, we were able to capture them and hive them up into another box. These are things you need to consider if you're going to be a beekeeper. In the old colony, the daughter queens often start piping just prior to emerging as adults. If you watch the bottom of that queen cell, you'll see she starts to cut across the bottom, making a trap door. And when she cuts all the way around, just leaving a hint, she'll start to push out, emerge out of that queen cell. And a few days after emerging, the new queen goes on one or more nuptial flights. These are called mating flights. If you're out there when she does it, it looks almost like they're swarming because a lot of the bees will come out and orient around the box while she's getting out and, and flying around. Each time she goes out on a nuptial flight, she'll mate with 1 to 17 drones. The drones are built just for this. Look at the size difference. There's a difference in the size of the drone's eyes, too. Their eyes are so large, they look like motorcycle goggles. They actually touch on the top of their head. Their whole goal in life is to find a queen and mate her. They gang up in these place called drone congregation areas, or DCAs, typically about the height of uh, treetops, and they'll just sit there and swarm around that area. The queens will fly out to those. They will not mate with the drones, and the drones do not mate with the queens that are in their own hive. They mate with queens from other hives. If they were to mate with their sister queens, the, it would be lethal to the offspring. The worker bees, knowing that, will cannibalize those offspring once, they, uh, once the eggs hatch. Once again, comparing the size of the queen's eyes to the drone's eyes, you see a big difference there because the drones have to spot the queen and fly to her, grasp her, and mate her while in flight, and then fall to the ground dead. This is an actual photograph of a drone mating a queen. The next illustrations will show you what takes place. Mates the queen. Once he's done mating, 
He turns loose and falls over backwards. As he's falling over backwards, the device coming out of his ovipositor, which is where the sperm is injected inside of the female's uh, abdomen, snaps off. Literally, it sounds like a person's finger snapping. And the drone falls to the ground dead. She goes back to the hive. Here's your queen in the center. And if you look right there at the end of her abdomen, that device that broke off of him is drying up and finishing pumping into her while she's still walking around in the hive. If you ever see this, don't try to remove this yourself. The workers will take care of it once it's done and once it's dried up. She'll mate with as many drones as possible because once she's done mating, she will never do it again. She will store that sperm inside of her abdomen and lay for the rest of her life. Typically uh, around 1,500 eggs a day. Once she's finished her mating, usually within two weeks of emerging, she remains in the hive laying eggs. The only time she'll ever leave that hive now is to abscond or swarm. Most of the eggs she lays will become non-fertile workers. Yet some of the eggs she lays will become fertile queens. Both from the same egg. Why? Epigenetics. Epi, meaning outside. Genetics, meaning what makes you up. If you look at your skin, it's called epidermis. It's your, the only organ you have that's on the outside of your body. You may say, I've never heard of this. There's no such thing. Where else can you show this in the animal kingdom? Alligators are epigenetic. Sex is fully determined at the time of hatching and naturally irreversible thereafter. It all depends on the temperature of the egg during incubation. Incubation temperatures for alligators, if they're below 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit, produce all females. If the incubation temperature is above 34 degrees Celsius or 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll yield all males. Yet if these eggs are incubated between 86 degrees Fahrenheit and 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll get an equal mix of males and females. It just depends on the temperature outside. It's epigenetic. This has nothing to do with temperature on our bees. It depends on what they're fed. You see, your queen is fed nothing but royal jelly from the time she hatches from an egg and becomes a larva. She'll be fed royal jelly the entire time she's in larva. She'll be fed royal jelly until she dies. You cannot feed a queen honey. She does not feed off of bee bread, which is a mixture of honey and nectar. Pollen. Bees like ourselves cannot digest pollen cells. So what they do is they mix the two together. They mix the pollen with the nectar and honey. And after it sets for a few days, it starts to ferment. And it makes a substance called bee bread. Which is why when you turn your, uh, go into your hives and look in your frames, when you find pollen, you're not looking at little old pollen specks like what you get at the store that you put over top of your ice cream. That goes right through you just like sawdust does. Your, your body can't digest that. What you have to do is take that pollen and place it inside of a honey or some other kind of liquid and keep it in your refrigerator someplace and, and allow it a few days to ferment. Once it ferments, then your body can digest the pollen just like the bees can. Many people don't know this, that they go out and buy the stuff, spend a lot of money on it, and it doesn't do them a bit of good because it passes right through your body without being able to digest it. If a female fertilized egg hatches and is fed nothing but royal jelly, it will come out a fertile queen. Yet that same egg, once it hatches, is still fed royal jelly for the first three days of its life. On the fourth day, the worker bees start feeding that larva a bee bread mixture. And because they stop feeding that larva royal jelly, that larva will pupate into an infertile worker bee. The only difference between these two is what they were fed while they were a larva. The queen, nothing but royal jelly. The worker, royal jelly for the first three days, bee bread from that point on. Drones, they're fed 
royal jelly for the first three days of their larval life also, and then they're fed bee bread also. Drones and workers can both feed off of bee bread and honey for the rest of their lives. It doesn't hurt them. It would be lethal for the queen to eat honey. Like other insects that undergo complete metamorphosis, the western honeybee has four distinct life stages. You got your egg, you got your larva right here. You can see where that larva is being fed because of that jelly that's in there. That larva's head is to the left, so it'll keep on circulating around that cell in a counterclockwise motion, eating its way around that circle. If it's not fed, that glistening fluid will all be eaten away and it would die of starvation. Each one of these larvae are fed, on average, 150 times a day, which is one of the reasons why we had the term busy as a bee. The life cycle of a bee, we'll look at uh, the worker bee. For three days, it's an egg. For six days, it's a larva. For 12 days, it's a pupa. And after 21 days after that egg was laid, a fully formed adult emerges out of that cell. That bee on the right is not hatching. She's emerging 18 days after she hatched from that egg. 21 days after the egg was laid, she emerges as a fully formed adult. Egg for three days, larva for six days, pupa for 12 days. On the 21st day, here she is. Worker bees secrete wax used to build the hive. They clean and maintain and guard it. They raise the young and forage for nectar and pollen. Each worker bee has eight wax glands, four on each side of the bottom of her abdomen. And they will sweat this wax for their entire adult life. Other bees walk up behind them. They'll go ahead and grab that with their mouth parts, chew it up, mixing it with the enzymes that are in their head. And that's what makes up the wax that's inside of your honeybee hive. The nature of the worker's role varies with age. For the first 10 days of their lives, worker bees clean the hive and feed the larva. And here you see a couple of them with their heads inside of there now feeding the larva. Remember, how many times are these larvae fed per day? On the average, 150 times. On a large deep frame, you're looking at 7,000 cells. It's a lot of work. After this, they begin building comb cell, which we showed you earlier with the festooning. On days 16 through 20, workers receive nectar and pollen from older workers and store it. Here are these two bees right here. One, a forager, is pumping nectar from her honey stomach to the workers, the house bees' honey stomach. She'll take that nectar and pump it inside of a cell at around 98 to 99% moisture level. Another worker bee will stand over top of that cell with its wings flapping, almost like running a fan across a dry floor. And they will dry that honey down from 98 to 99% to 16 to 17% moisture level and then cap that honey. At, nine, at 16 to 17% moisture level, bacteria cannot even thrive inside of that honey. Honey has been found that's over 3,000 years old. It's still edible, so long as the moisture level didn't rise in it and it fermented. After the 20th day, a worker leaves the hive to orient itself and spends the remainder of its life as a forager. And these are the bees that we find out in the wild on the flowers and flying around. During the summer months, during the time that the flowers are blooming, Worker bees typically only live about 60 to 65 days. The first 21 days is inside of the cell, developing from an egg to a larva to a pupa and then emerging. The next 20 to 22 days are as a house bee, doing all the work that's inside of the hive. The last 20 days of its life are spent outside as a forager, the bees that we see outside, the honeybee. Queens and workers have a modified ovipositor. It's another word for a stinger. The one on the left is a queen stinger. It's not barbed. The one on the right is a worker bee stinger. It is barbed. 
The queen stinger is only used for one reason and one reason only. That's to fight other queens. Queens are like the, the Highlander movie. There can be only one inside of the hive. Now, there will always be exceptions. My wife and I have found more than one queen inside of hives before, but there are exceptions to the rule. It's typically only one queen. If they find another queen, they will fight it and uh, either kill it or it will leave the hive and take some of the bees with it. This is typically what happens when you put two honeybee queens together. Worker bees, on the other hand, when they sting, the stinger doesn't come right back out where they can use it over and over again like a queen bee can. It's pulled loose because it has barbs in it. So whenever they sting anything with elastic skin like a mammal, reptile, or bird, when they, when they go to pull away, when they go to walk away, that pulls out. And what you see behind her is her gut being pulled out of her abdomen. She's going to die. She's, she's, uh, this is lethal to a worker bee. Here you see a bee that has stung somebody on the wrist and now they're trying to fly away. Well, the gut's being pulled out, so this bee's going to die also. What's going on down there where that stinger is at? Well, that stinger is his own little unit, and just like when you cut the, chin, the head off of a chicken and the body flops around, when that stinger pulls out of the bee, it has one thing to do and one thing only. It pumps venom, and that venom keeps pumping until it's all gone. What you do not want to do is reach down there and grab that stinger and pull it out. Because when you go to grab it, you're going to squish that venom sac and inject every bit of that venom inside of your body. The best way to get rid of a stinger is scrape it off with the edge of a credit card or your fingernail. Don't grab it. Scrape it. Like I said, if you grab it, you're going to inject every bit of venom inside of that, inside of your body. Whereas if you scrape it, it'll stop the moment you scrape it off. Here's your three types of bees inside of the hive, your worker, your queen, and your drone. You have to have all three of these in order to have a successful hive. This is a more caramel colored queen, most likely a, 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 an Italian. There's your queen right there. There's your drone. And all the rest of them on this picture are worker bees. They don't always look the same. Sometimes you'll get a dark queen like this. It's just the genetics. This is a newly emerged queen. Bee that's just come out of a uh, cell, a worker bee. And you can tell it's newly emerged by looking at its thorax. It's covered in hair. Now, what's the difference between the worker and the queen bee? Well, one of the things you can look at is the length of the queen bee's wings to her abdomen. You'll typically have three to four segments of her abdomen beyond her wings. Whereas on a worker bee, the wings will cover out most of the abdomen, sometimes all of it. Another thing about the worker bee is, once again, her thorax, when she first emerges, has a lot of hair on it. The queen will never have hair on her thorax. It'll always be black to dark brown. Now, older worker bees, the hair will start to wear off as they get older. So it can be confusing sometimes. Many people will say they think they found the queen when all they found was the drone. And of course, if you look at that drone, you see huge differences by seeing all three of them on that same frame right there. But not, not many times do you see them all in one place like that that you can tell the difference. So people do get confused on them. The biggest thing about the drone is just looking at his eyes. They touch on the top. Now, some of these others look like they touch on the top also like over in here, over in here. But actually what you're seeing is you're seeing the ocelli, the three eyes that they can tell where the, where the sun's at. The honeybee. Your queen. Your drone. And all the rest are workers. A good hive is going to need about fifty to 60,000 of these workers in order to make honey for you. Here's your typical frame inside of a beehive. Your sealed brood over here is going to look like burnt biscuits when you look down there. The white stuff that you see in there is larva. When it's covered in white like that, that means that, large is, that larva is large enough where it's about to pupate. It will get covered over by that uh, burnt biscuit look. Open brood over here, it's going to look kind of glistening, but you can see like a little worm in there, and that's the larva or an egg 
And the reason why it's glistening is because they've been feeding it. Up here is pollen. Sometimes your pollen will look like a stained glass window. This is pollen on a frame. And then you got your honey. Your honey will take two different aspects. This is called wet capped honey. It's nothing wrong with this honey. People say it looks greasy. It looks like it's gone bad. It just means that the honey is touching the wax from the inside of the cell. That's all it means. Wet capped. People like this, they say it looks cleaner. It just means that there's like a, just a smidgen of space between that capping and the honey. And because of that, it doesn't have that wet, greasy look. Both honeys are the same and they taste the same. On your brood, you're going to see different types of cells. These two peanuts coming off of the brood cell are queen cells. The rest of this is worker cells. Going back to what I was calling burnt biscuits look, look earlier. Now, if you're dealing with a swarm or a package of bees and you do not have an established hive when you start keeping bees, you may say, well, my cat brood is not brown like what I saw on this illustration. It's yellow. The reason why it's yellow is because your bees have to chew something into the wax to make it to where the air will pass through the wax. Wax is airtight. So they have to chew something in the wax in order to allow air to go through it. So what they'll do in a new hive is chew up pollen and mix it with the wax to cap over those pupa. And that's why it's the color that it is here, yellow. In this picture, it's not yellow because they're an established hive. So instead of wasting the pollen, which they can use for food for their young, they're chewing up the old cocoons from the established cells where worker bees have already emerged. Remember, we showed you the four stages of life for the bee. The egg, the larva, the pupa, the adult. Just like a butterfly or a moth. What happens to that cocoon? That cocoon stays inside of that cell. The worker bees will chew that cocoon up, mix it with the wax, and that's why this brood looks like burnt biscuits. Because instead of pollen, like this, they're mixing up those cocoons and making the wax darker and brown, which gives you that burnt biscuit look. These other cells, these drone cells, they stick out from the comb a little bit. In fact, it looks like a used rounded eraser. It's very easy to tell, especially on a hive like this, which one is which, because you got the three different characteristics of the three different type of bees that are in your hive, the queen, the worker, and the drone. But drones are very easy to spot because it just looks like they're knobby pencil erasers sticking out, maybe a three quarters, maybe an eighth to a quarter of an inch. The hive. How does this work? Well, the bees find a place to go and they start drawing out comb. You saw what earlier by festooning. As they do that, the queen will start laying eggs. That brown section becomes brood comb. Brood is now in this comb. And as they're drawing it out, she's still laying. That white part right on top of the brood, that's where the pollen will be. Right above the pollen will be the honey. And they'll draw it out and draw it out and draw it out and draw it out and draw it out. This thing could be hollow from the top to the bottom, and bees will fill that thing up. But you think, well, they're going to they're gonna have to do something now. The hive's full. There's no more room for them to go. Well, this hive's in equilibrium right now, and I'll tell you why. 21 days ago, the queen started laying eggs up there in the top of that comb. Now a fully grown adult has emerged out of there. When that happens, remember I told you that they, they communicate through pheromones? The queen being down here is just finished laying in the last open cell. Well, up here, she smells the pheromone coming from a newly emerged adult. She goes up to investigate. There are other newly emerged adults coming out. She starts laying up there and works her way back down here again. Once again, she gets down here, she starts smelling newly emerged adults back up here. So she goes back up there and it's just a constant back and forth, back and forth, laying laying and laying well the hive decides to swarm 
You see, it's not the queen that decides to swarm. It's the workers. Once they decide they want to swarm, they start backfilling her laying area. And so you see the more honey, more honey, less laying area, more honey, less laying area, more honey, less laying area. And eventually the queen runs out of places to lay. And she goes to these little cups that are always facing down. We call them false queen caps. And she'll lay inside of one of them, like what you see here. The one on the right has a queen in it. You don't even have to see what's inside of there. If you see a worker up inside of one of them like this, she's feeding something. Once that happens, they'll go ahead and pull it out, make it a queen cell, and seal it. Once this is polished and getting ready to emerge, a fully grown queen, the hive swarms. After the hive swarm, maybe a couple hours or a couple of days, this queen will start emerging. Well, look over here. This is your typical queen emerge cell right there. A little trap door has already opened up. She's come out. Thankfully for this queen, this queen over here didn't go up here and chew a hole and sting this queen while she was still inside of her queen cell. They do do that. If she had done that, this queen would have died. So now that you know about the honeybee, how do I get started beekeeping? First things first. Number one, you need to join a beekeeping club. I know it may sound hokey to folks that I want to do this all on my own. You can get a lot more information if you just go ahead and join a club. It's not that expensive. I think typically they're about $20 a year, and there's a lot of advantages that come with it. If you want to be a beekeeper and you want to start dealing with honey and stuff like that, many beekeeping clubs have their own extractors. They have times when you can get together and do an extract of Ganza or all kinds of different things that, to help each other out. But you should join a beekeeping club just to keep up with what's going on out there. There's a lot of things you need to keep up with as a beekeeper. As beekeepers, we are the first line of defense for Africanized honeybees, the first line of defense for different pests and diseases that are out there. So it just helps to be a good beekeeper uh, by joining a beekeeping club. Number two, get yourself a mentor. Find somebody who owns bees and get inside of one of their hives before you go out and get your own. I've seen too many failures where people have waited and not gone into bees until they started doing it themselves and realized this wasn't for them. So you want to go find somebody that's got bees, get permission from them to go sit with them one day or or do an inspection with them and, uh, and, and just let, uh, let them give you a chance to get around their bugs. Get a mentor. Number three, look before you leap. There's a lot of stuff out there that, uh, that, that is just plain false. Uh, people will say uh, there's only one way to raise bees. And I tell people if you want to uh, talk to five different beekeepers, you're going to find out 20 different ways to keep bees. I tell folks if you raise bees and you kept them alive for over a year, you're doing it right doesn't matter what anybody said to you. Remember, you're dealing with a wild bug. Look before you leap. And number four, read, read, read. There's all kinds of stuff you can see on YouTube from Fat Bee Men to Michael Bush and all in between. You can look up our, our YouTube channel. But what just, just try to find out as much as you possibly can. Uh, take notes. Uh, take pictures. Uh, set up a camera while you're doing your inspection so you can go back and look at what you did right and what you did wrong later on. All of these things will help you later on to become a good beekeeper. This was the very first apiary my wife and I set up at our house. And, uh, you know, everything's brand new looking. Know this, it won't look brand new after the first year. But I uh, set this up on a couple of blocks. Where we live at, we have skunks. So your beehive needs to be at least 18 inches above the ground if you have skunks. Because if not, they will eat all your bees up. If they have to stand up and stretch in order to reach your bees, the bees can reach their underparts and sting them and they won't stay there long. So this is our first hive. Apiary location. Well, your honeybees should not become nuisances to your neighbors. If they do, you'll face problems with your, their complaints. Imagine being a, your, your, a, a next door neighbor to a person who's got a bunch of bees and you've got a backyard swimming pool. Bees need water. 
So as a beekeeper, you need to consider your neighbors. Now, some people will say, uh, it's none of my neighbor's business what I do. Well, if you feel that way and your bees are not bothering anybody, you won't have any problems. Because I have seen people that have just not told anybody that they have bees. And sometimes that's a good thing because once people find out that you do have bees, you've just become the residential expert on anything with wings and a stinger. No matter whose bees go into somebody's flower bed, it will always be your bees were over at my house today. So some people just don't tell anybody. And many times people will never know that you have bees unless you've got so many of them that they're swarming all the time. Number two, the front of the beehive should face toward the sun and away from prevailing winds. That's going to be southeast to east down here in southern Virginia. All of my hives face south. Number three, hives should be located within a short flying distance of a water source. Well, this was easy for us because that's a ditch right there in front of those hives. By having that ditch in front of them, it meant that I was going to be at least eight to ten feet away from the hive whenever I cut the grass in front of it. So it kept me from disturbing the bees too much. If you are cutting the grass around your beehives, don't turn the chute to where it faces a hive. You're just going to make a mess and then you're going to make them angry. Remember, they're a wild bug. You're not, you're not there to just offend them and, and tick them off. You're, you're, you're raising them to either help you with pollination or to get their honey or, or whatever other reason you may be doing it. Number four, though most feral hives are found in shady areas, domesticated hives do better in full sun during summer months due to small hive beetles. And you can see right here, this was in full sun. Our particular apiaries get full sun from the morning all the way up to 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. On the west side of our apiary, we've got woods. However, hardwoods and cedars do not draw beetles as badly as if you do not have them in uh, full sun. Never, ever place your hives under pines. Something about pine trees just draws the small hive beetles. And you need to have easy access to the hives. If you don't have easy access to them, you're not going to go check them out. You're not going to do your inspections and it'll become a lesson in futility. Here's five ways you can begin a colony of bees at your apiary. You can start with a swarm. Starting with a swarm, as stated earlier, honeybee colonies reproduce through a process called swarming. Swarming typically occurs from March through June in tidewater. This is typical as we've responded to swarms every month of the year. Advantages of starting with a swarm, the bees are free or very inexpensive. The hive will build up very fast. Disadvantages of starting with a swarm, you cannot depend on getting a swarm when you need it. You have no control over genetics, type of bees you're getting. They could be prone to swarming or hive will build up very fast. Wait a minute, that sounds familiar. That's also one of the advantages. Swarms will build up very fast. Once you catch a swarm, box it. You need to get inside that box every week for the first few weeks after you get that thing. Find out how fast they're growing because they're going to fill up frames within a few days. They are prone to do that. When they swarm, they have just gorged on everything that was in their last hive, and they've got nothing until they create their new hive. So they're going to build up very fast. Starting with a nuke. NUC stands for nucleus hive. When you start with a nucleus hive, you're starting with a five frame hive. There's your five frames. Inside that five frame hive, this is what you should expect. Your two outside frames going back to one and five should look like this. They should have resources like honey, pollen, nectar. You should have at least two frames that look like this in places one and five. The other three, should include a laying queen, that's that girl with the red blue mark on her back, and lots and lots of brood. Whether it's cat brood, eggs, larva, you should have at least three frames inside of your nuke that looks like this. And they're going to be where frames two, three, and four are. It may cost more than a package of bees, and it will contain at least two or three frames of brood, a laying queen, and eggs and larvae in various stages of development. The nuke will have drawn comb rather than foundation. If you get a nuke and the foundation looks like this, somebody's not selling you a nucleus hive, they're selling you a package of bees on new foundation. You don't, you don't, you should never pay for a nuke that looks like this. That's what that frame should look like. Not like this. 
Watch out for nukes sold with just bees and new foundation. This is nothing more than a package put into a box. This kind of nuke would not develop any faster than a package of bees. Advantages of a nucleus hive, it's already a miniature hive with a laying queen and brood. The bee population is growing because new bees are being added to the population every day. This hive should produce a good crop of honey the first year. Disadvantages of a nucleus hive, some sellers try to sell a nuke by using very old comb or dark comb. Or start a nuke on a new foundation which is not drawn out when, they, when you buy the nuke. Avoid paying a pri high price for such nukes. A nuke will need more room in the hive immediately after taking delivery. If you buy a five frame nuke for my wife and I, and you take it home and you just leave it in a five frame box for a couple of days, your bees are going to swarm on you because they're already out of room when I sell it to you. You're going to have to take that five frame nuke and put it inside of a 10 frame box or put another five frame box on top or on bottom of this to get them room to grow. Starting with an established hive. These are going to be your most expensive. It's usually the one way to assure yourself a honey crop the first year, uh, but remember they're wild bugs, something could happen. This hive will contain drawn combs, some honey reserves, and a good population of honeybees. The hive will be expensive if it is housed in like new equipment. Prices vary according to condition of equipment. Note, we're not discussing a new hive stocked with new frames, undrawn foundation, and a newly installed package of bees. Remember the picture I showed you earlier of just foundation? That's not what an established hive looks like. It's got bees in it, and there's different stages of brood. Advantages of an established hive. This hive should produce a good crop of honey the first year. This hive could be split into two hives if it is strong enough. Disadvantages of an established hive? It is going to be the highest cost of getting into beekeeping. It may swarm early in the bee season. It will require honey supers quickly in the spring. Management of this hive will differ from other hives started with smaller populations. You will be on a quicker timeline. Disadvantages of an established hive? Because an established hive has drawn comb, one must be aware that drawn comb may include American fowl brood spores. This is a serious disease. It may also have large populations of mites, which will need to be controlled. It may have an old queen, which needs to be replaced. Another way of starting a hive is from a structural removal. We get these all the time where bees get inside of houses, buildings, sheds, up in porch roofs. In a structural removal, the comb containing honey and nectar is not usable as the weight of the comb typically does not allow for installing it in frames. I always take a few food grade buckets and maybe a cooler with me. Any honeycomb, I just drop it down inside of there. It's going to be processed when I get home. It's impossible to put that stuff in frames. The brood comb, on the other hand, I'll lay it out on top of an empty frame, cut off the top and bottom, give it a flat edge and it rubber banded right into the frame. They'll attach all of that once you put it inside the hive. Starting with a hive from a structural removal. Hive has to be removed from a house or other structure. The queen may have lived through the removal process or the bees will make a new queen. This takes added attention from the beekeeper to care, feed, and help the hive build for winter. Because an established hive has drawn comb, one must be aware that drawn comb may include American fowl brood spores. This is a serious disease. It may also have mites, which will need to be controlled. Most times feral bees are calm and disease free with only a few mites. It may have an old queen, which needs to be replaced. Starting with a package of bees. This is a typical package of bees. This is a group of them ready to ship. Advantages of a package of bees, it is moderate in cost. It's one of the cheapest ways of getting bees. They sell them in two, three, and five pound packages. The bees are inspected in the state of origin. However, they may contain bees with mites and small hive beetles. A good dealer in packaged bees will indicate to you that this is possible and will be willing to do something to help you if the problem is serious. The bees can be scheduled for arrival so you can be ready for them when they arrive. Disadvantages of a package of bees, they take longer to develop into a production hive. 
The queen sold with the package is not part of these bees' colony. These bees were shaken from several hives to make up the proper weight for the package, so not even all the bees are from the same colony. This is your typical queen cages that will come with your package. This is one with a queen and her attendants in the queen cage and another type of queen cage. These are queens in their queen cages being banked for shipment. Another nice thing about being a member of a bee club is that sometimes honeybee clubs will order queens so that folks making splits in the spring can go ahead and add some new characteristics or genetics into their apiaries. The queen sold with the package is untested. Disadvantages of a package of bees is, once again, she's untested. This means you can face several queen problems, such as the queen not being accepted by the bees in the package. The queen may be a poor laying queen or poorly mated. Super seizure problems. The queen is replaced by the bees during the current season. Or she may exhibit aggressiveness in the bees she produces. Much discussion is taking place in the U.S. among beekeepers concerning the threat of Africanized honeybee genetics showing up in southern raised queens. It may just be a matter of time before northern beekeepers will be dealing with this problem. The package may contain bees with mites and small hive beetles or other problems. Most package producers are from states that have Africanized honeybees. So once again, this is where the beekeeper is the first line of defense from keeping these type of bees from where we're at. To date, there is no proof to guarantee that queens or bees from these areas do not have Africanized honeybee traits or genetics. If a queen fails, the beekeeper needs to quickly react before the new hive is lost. The beekeeper should check to see if the new queen is laying eggs within the first week after the package is installed into a hive. No eggs means something's wrong. Usually a package of bees is not guaranteed for success by the seller. Here's your typical package. This right here is like a piece of Luan plywood or heavy cardboard. You pry that off and you pull out a can. That can is sugar water. It's been used to feed those bees while they've been en route to your house. Just before you pull that can all the way out, there's typically going to be a tab on one side or the other on there. You grab that tab because on the other end of that tab is your queen inside of a queen cage. You don't want it to drop down inside of those bees. When you pull it out, it's going to be covered in bees. They want to get to that queen. You take that queen, put her inside of your hive, and then you dump the rest of the bees on top of her. So five ways to begin a colony of bees. Start with a swarm. Start with a nuke. Start with an established hive. Start with a colony from a structural removal. Start with a package of bees. A few notes. An established hive, though most expensive, will be the nearest to an assurance that the beekeeper will reap a honey reward. Colony production and buildup is much faster with a nuke, swarm, or even a cutout when compared to a package. All forms of new colonies will require care and maintenance. My wife and I inspect our hives once a week during swarm season. Now, many beekeepers will tell you that's too much. It'll run your bees away. No, it won't. Remember earlier when I was showing you the four stages of the bee's life cycle. Three days is an egg, six days is a larva, 12 days is a pupa, and then fully formed adult comes out in 21 days. Drop that down for a queen. A queen, the egg is laid. She fully emerges in 16 days. So that's three days as an egg, five days as a larva, eight days as a pupa. Remember I told you that the larva of all bees hatched are fed royal jelly for the first three days of their life. So if a queen egg is laid and 16 days later she emerges as an adult, she spent three days of those 16 days as an egg that drops you down to 13 days. The first three days of that larva's life, all female larva, all male larva are fed nothing but royal jelly. 
If it's a female larva, it can still be made into a queen. We are now six days into that 16 days. Now we're down to 10 days. That's less than two weeks. If the bees decide to supersede that queen, if something happens to the queen and they have to replace her, that three-day-old larva is perfectly set to continue to be fed royal jelly. And so for the next two days, they feed that larva royal jelly. It's going to pupate as a queen. And it's going to swarm before you get back in that hive two weeks later. By two days. So that's why during swarm season, we'll check our hives out once a week. Just that little information, I hope, keeps you from losing your bees. I'm Buddy Hogger. You can find me at buddyhogger at gmail.com. We're at B&G's Bees on Facebook. And you can look, at us, look us up at Hog Heaven on YouTube. I appreciate you watching. I appreciate y'all having here during this time.